In this episode of the podcast, I sit down with Los Angeles, California-based photographer Alexis Hunley. Alexis and I sit down and discuss her experiences documenting the protests in and around Los Angeles, as well as how she's staying safe and not becoming part of the news documenting those protests amidst a global pandemic. This is Twitter. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today on the show, I have Alexis Hunley on the hot seat. We're going to be talking about sort of her evolution as a self-taught photographer through to being featured in some major brands and some, some major publications around the world. We're going to talk about that as well as her efforts in documenting the COVID-19 crisis, as well as engaging on the Black Lives Matter protests and photographing that. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. So Alexis, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I appreciate this. In, in this, our first week of 2021, right? So... Right. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> Barely. Yeah, I'm like, okay, it's 2021. Where are flying cars? And where are the aliens? And where's the. <laughs> it's still the same. <laughs> Right. <laughs> it's all the same. We've been gypped. Um, so let's dive into this. We have a lot of stuff to talk about, um, and I don't want to. I don't want to waste any of our time on this. So let's let's dive into your history a little bit. I want to before we dive into the meat of the conversation, set the stage. Who is Alexis Hunley, and what what brings you into this world of image making and photon capturing? Oh well, it's. It's a little bit of a long story, but essentially I'm LA based and I am self-taught photographer. Started teaching myself about three and a half years ago now. So in 2017, um, originally my academic background is in psychology. I always thought I was going to be a clinician and then kind of jumped through different types of jobs, always searching for something that was creative and engaging and eventually landed on photography following the passing of my grandmother. Um, she was kind of the artist of the family. She had her own dark room. She did all of our family portraits. She laid tile, she sewed, she did everything. And so after she passed, it was kind of a way for me to process and to grieve and stay connected to her. And then with some support from family and friends, decided one day I was like, okay, this is it. This is, this is what I'm gonna do. And decided to hop onto YouTube University and go to the library and, you know, just test and test and test. And here we are. Isn't that crazy? Photography is one of those, those hobbies slash professions slash addictions, right? <laughs> that, 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 I don't want it's weird because I don't want to say it's easy because photography is not easy. It's it's a people are practicing photography because you never really know everything about it because the physics, the psychology, the technology is always morphing and changing and all that. But from a self taught perspective, you and I were talking about this a little bit before we start recording from a self taught perspective, I feel like photographers that that feel that burning desire to learn it themselves and then become good and keep pushing it forward are, you know, in some ways superior or better, maybe superior is the wrong word, but in some ways they have an advantage over people that have been sort of boxed in and taught from a traditional educational standpoint. What, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like it was harder for you to, to kind of get up to where you are being self-taught or would the path have been easier had you sat down in a chair with a bunch of other students with cameras learning how to do this stuff? You know, that's a really great question. And I've been thinking about it more recently. And I think for me personally, if I had had that sort of structured education, it would have stifled a lot of the creativity that I brought into a lot of my earlier work and experimentation and may have completely shifted the way that I approach my projects and I allow myself to like express you know, what's inside of me and what I want to show because of, you know, other people's perceptions and biases that come out when they teach, you can't help it. But having that early part of my photo career being shaped by the things that interest me and other works of art and books and just allowing myself the space to fail and experiment and create in a way that I really wanted to completely shaped the way that I see things now. And so... 
you know, I, it would have been a totally different experience, I think, if I had, you know, been in a classroom, like you said, with other students and been shaped by somebody else. Isn't it interesting? I think photography is, is this goes for everything, but photography in particular in the context of this discussion. But when you when you book learn something or YouTube video learn something or whatever and you see it on the screen, you're like, oh, I get that. F stop shutter speed. Yeah. Inverse square law. I understand that. Yeah. Easy. And then when you put that camera in your hand, this complex piece of machine and technology and you go out. At least for me, sometimes that stuff just goes out the window. You're like, okay, what? Wait, what? <laughs> why yeah. why is this? Why is it still dark? I don't get it. <laughs> did, did you ever hit those those weird walls? Oh, all the time, all the time. And that, I mean, that was a part of the learning process. You know, I I still have more to learn, but like even just being more technically proficient opens up that door for, you know, the creativity of like, okay, maybe I do want it more dark now, or I do want this motion blur, or I do want this thing that I originally thought was a mistake or a failure. Like this is a new creative lane that I can explore. So yeah. trial and error is invaluable for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you, so you don't do anything halfway. So your trial and error was documenting COVID-19, which we are still <laughs> hopefully towards the end of, but who knows? We may be at the beginning of it. <laughs> but, right, you yeah. know? So, so you're documenting COVID-19 in Los Angeles, which as we know, as we record this is January 6, 2021, is one of the most hard hit places in the United States. People are saying that there is no safe place in Los Angeles is pretty much you know, it's blank. If you look at L.A. from a map of covid coverage, it's all red on, right. on the map. You are documenting that and you're also documenting the Black Lives Matter protests. Or you were shooting that as well. Let's talk about the covid side of it. What are you doing there and how are how are you? How have you chosen to document the pandemic? So originally how that started was at the beginning of the pandemic back in March of last year. So 2020, um, all of my other jobs canceled. And so instead of, you know, I was a little concerned just in terms of money, but I was like, oh, this is an opportunity for me to explore the, the documentary projects and like this other side of photography that I haven't had a chance to, you know, dabble in. And so I decided um, just with the knowledge of like how things work that, you know, I already had an idea that the neighborhood I live in, which is predominantly black, would probably hit hardest by this pandemic. And so in addition to that understanding, like how that would segue and like how that would impact the gentrification that's already happening in my neighborhood, um, I decided that it was really important to start documenting, not just within my own family and my neighbors, but the community at large. Um, and for a long term project and seeing how this pandemic is going to physically change my neighborhood. And so that's that's originally how it started within my own household with my neighbors. Um, babies were born, graduation parades, you know, socially distant birthday car drive bys, things like that. Um, and so that was like the natural segue into the Black Lives Matter movement kind of prepared me for that sort of documentary work. Um, and so now where we are with COVID, I'm having to rethink and reapproach how I'm going to continue documenting because when you walk outside in LA, unless you're walking into a hospital, you, you can't tell really. Like you, you see the numbers, you're seeing things on the news, but it's hard because LA is so spaced out that mm -hmm. there aren't refrigerated trucks on neighborhood blocks there aren't body bags like you're not seeing the impact physically unless you're seeing like anti-mask protests and things like that um and so that's what i've been doing for the last couple of days is rethinking like how do i show what's happening in the middle of the surge in la while also keeping myself safe and my family safe in the midst of the continuation of the black lives matter movement and so yeah. It's, and how do you how do you do that? How do you keep yourself safe in that? Because I, I feel like it's even here. I'm in Northern California. And even here, whenever I leave the house, I feel like it's the walking dead. Right. <laughs> I feel like there's zombies everywhere and they're trying to get me and I got to get what I got to get and get back to the compound. That's what I, I feel like. How do you stay safe? Then how do you keep yourself? And like you said, your family safe going out there and, and getting these pictures and making them impactful enough for others to kind of get it of what's going on. 
Yeah, so it has been a journey um, trying to figure out the ways that I can minimize my risk and also still do the work that I need to do. So a large part of that has been making sure, you know, that I have the proper PPE and that, you know, I'm always, you know, with a N95 or a K95 doubled with a surgical mask. I live with hand sanitizer, Clorox wipes, I'm wiping down my gear, my car, everything. And then at the beginning of the protest, as I was going out more and more in larger crowds, I was self-isolating more frequently from my family um, and getting COVID tests as often as every other week, just just to be sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that's yeah. See, that's that's dedication. What you're doing is is the, you know, my, like we were talking about before. My background is in combat photojournalism in the in the Air Force, and what you're doing is putting yourself in harm's way in service of the story, in service of the greater good, which is, I know you don't call yourself a photojournalist, but you know, we all have our feet in different, in different socks, right? So that's, that's photojournalism, you know, documenting something to share it with people that may not be able to see it or understand the gravity of a particular situation. You're, you're not going to, so I want I want to switch gears from the, from the COVID stuff a little bit for a second and talk about the Black Lives Matter protests. Obviously you and I are both black. We can't go outside and not be black and with a camera i'm interested to know how that how that dynamic plays out during a pro protest in a city like los angeles typically on this week in photo we talk about the camera as the passport because people look at it and they say oh got a camera i can't be a bad person right it lets you into certain situations where you wouldn't be able to get in but things shift a little bit when you're now a black photographer with a camera inside of a protest that pertains to black people and black lives. Tell me, take us into that. How does that dynamic play out when your stuff's going on around you and you're shooting? It is, so I had to do a lot of processing on this back in the summer because it didn't hit me until like a couple weeks later, like how heavy those situations can be um, because like you said, we can't separate our blackness from being a photographer or being any other part of our identities. Like I carry that weight of being black with me and I feel the weight of, you know, the fact that there is an added level of danger for me, um, not just as a person with a camera, but also as a black person, as a woman, like it takes a lot of, time and self-care and effort to make sure that I am able to process everything so that I'm able to do the work that I need to do and the work that I feel proud of. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, the you know, it's so interesting because it's hard. It's hard having a conversation like this when we're in the middle of something, right? We're, we're in the middle of COVID still. Black Lives Matter is going to be going on, hopefully in perpetuity. And your and your position to document this. How do you stay strong? <laughs> like, how do you how do you stay strong with all this pandemonium going all around you, both from the protests and from all the news every day, what's happening in politics and what's happening, you know, with with the with the pandemic and who knows? That's that's just what we see on the surface. Who knows what's going on in Alexis's personal life, right? So, uh, how do you how do you maintain and still you know get the shot and stay smiling throughout all of this this sort of craziness? Yeah, I, I had to learn how to ask people for help. Um, and so I typically am not the type of person to ask for help or ask for what I need. I, I'm so used to doing things by myself. But at a certain point in May and June, it was just kind of like, I, I can't handle all of this by myself. And so one of the big pieces of like my support system was the fact that I was a a grant recipient of a um, of a grant from Adobe, the Adobe Creative Resi Residency Community Fund, and mm -hmm. so this fund was created by Adobe to provide support to a multitude of artists. Um, you know, following the beginning of quarantine and the pandemic, not just monetary support but career guidance, and so I received this grant, and it came at a time where. I wasn't really receiving any work. I was doing the documentary work around COVID and BLM, but 
I was struggling. And so that financial stability really helped, but even more important and like what will always stay with me is some of the the folks at Adobe and other residents and people within the fund provided me like emotional support to the point where they reached out just to see if I was okay. And I let them know like, hey, I need PPE. They're shooting tear gas and pepper spray. People are being harmed physically. Also, it's a pandemic. Can you guys help me get the the protective gear that I need? And within that week, I received uh, a respirator, some masks, hand sanitizer, just everything that I needed. And so individuals like that, organizations like that, uh, mutual aid funds, just friends and family members, other photographers, specifically my uh, Black photojournalistic peers have been a huge, huge part of like how I've been able to weather this storm and like continue to do what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, it's... There's so many questions, Alexis. So many, so many questions. What would you say? You know, looking at the, just the last four years, you know, that we've the four years or three years and fifty weeks, right? <laughs> that we've gone through. <laughs> so, what what would you say is the the thing that changed you most as a person or as an artist over this this time span? Oh, is it, we've all changed. What would you What would you say is the thing that you has either changed you or has been kind of an epiphany or revelation? Mm, that is a great question. What immediately comes to mind is I realized that I not only deserve to be here just as a person, but also as an artist, but that my perspective and the work that I do matters. Um, and that it's important that I continue what I'm doing in whatever lane that I end up going down or the simultaneous lanes. Um, the last three years and some change um, definitely pushed me to recognize those things in myself, but also to be brave enough to let other people see me. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. And we're all going through similar things. It's, it's, it, it's interesting. And I'm curious, like as, as you're out there with the camera and you're, you're shooting one of the protests, Black Lives Matter protests or demonstrations, the, the thing that, that kind of hit me over the past couple of years was the not so much the Black Lives Matter movement, but the anti-Black Lives Matter movement. You know, because I look at that as, as a as as a black person, I look at people that that are protesting and disagree with that movement, re whatever their reasons. I look at that as, so you're saying I don't matter, right? so it's okay if me or my kid or you know, we could just die, you know, and it's, it's fine, you know, as long as all these other things stay in place. So I, it, it literally has been a reckoning over the past couple of years. And we, t I've talked about it publicly on, on uh, several shows. It's been a reckoning of understanding. And I think starting with, with the election four years ago, it was looking at the, the, the divisiveness in the country was not what I thought it was. I, and I, I likened it to, lifting up uh, an old piece of wood in the backyard and seeing a bunch of bugs underneath it that you had no idea were there, but now they're there. So you got to deal with them. That's it. It took it's, and it's still a process. It takes that to, to, for me to deal with it and even family members, right? So family members that are on both, both quote sides of the aisle and kind of looking at them like, do you realize what's going on? And you know, it's just weird. Do you do you tangle with that kind of thing? Just kind of the the inner struggle of, yeah, I got to get these shots. But that person right there thinks I don't deserve to be around as much as that person with less melanin than I'd have. Like, how do you reckon with that? It is. It's really difficult. I'm not going to lie. It sits with me very heavy um, because. You know, it wasn't a surprise to me how things have moved in the last few years, only because like my academic background is in psychology, but also in mm. African American studies. So I've relatively, you know, I've taken my time to dive into these things prior to this movement. But I remember I went to a um, Trump rally in Beverly Hills on the 7th. So the day that we found out Biden was going to be president elect. And it was the only one I've been to. I've never felt safe going to any others. Um, 
not just because they don't wear masks, but just because of the general tone. Mm. And it really shook me being there more so as an individual black person than as a documentarian, because it was it was like a celebrated wanton disregard for the fact that like I deserve to live safely. Um, but not even just me, but anybody who isn't a cisgendered, heterosexual, you know, white Christian person, even though there were plenty of people there who didn't fit those categories. And so it was a lot of like trying to grapple with this visible cognitive dissonance and just like non what seems nonsensical outside of the understanding of the framework of like white supremacy you know it was it's upsetting as a person to understand that like like you said people just don't care mm -hmm. about our ability to live safely if it interferes with their ability to you know, continue living in a white supremacist society. And so it's something that I have to tangle with intellectually, but then also save space to like process through emotionally, which is a lot more difficult. Yeah. And, and you threw yourself into a Trump rally. I, I, there's been none conveniently close to where I am. Um, and I don't, even if there were, I don't know if I'd, I'd go, but I'm curious, like when you, when you went to that, like, I, I don't know. I know it's wrong, but I, I look at those like as like going to a Klan rally or something. I'm like, you, you just don't feel welcome. You want you feel for your life and your safety. You know, this entire mass of people think you're less than. Why would you go? Like, did you go to documented or did you go just for like you said, you have a psychology background. Did you go just to kind of understand the psychology of, of that group of people? What was the motivation? It was purely for documentary reasons, because mm -hmm. like, while I'm curious with that, like that psychological, like fascination piece of me, the, the sociological, anthropological part as a person, I don't want to engage with those things. They they weigh too heavy on me. And it's it's not there's no discussion to be had. I'm not going to argue with anybody about the validity of my life or anything about my identity. It, it's not a conversation. And so, you know, while I was there, I, I did my job. I was working, I'm keeping my mouth shut, I'm documenting, I'm giving people space. Also people weren't wearing masks. Um, mm. But it was interesting because most people looked right through me. They completely acted like I didn't exist, which was fine with me. But there were a few people who made points to stop and tell me I was liberal media or shout that I was a Nazi, which, okay, or just like other nonsensical things. And then I look over and there's this, this black man and he's talking to a group of white people and he has a sign about white genocide being real. And I'm just like, what is happening? Like, it's fascinating and scary at the same time because I realized a lot of people there were living in a completely different reality. And then that's when the kind of concern set in, like, what happens when they realize Trump is not going to be president and he's not coming back and like these things are not going to pan out the way that they see like where does that what does that mean for my safety and the safety of other people like me so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah I agree yeah and it yeah that and just the I, I liken it to just almost like religion right because it's when, when I looked at that red map, you know, after after the election of Trump and which is very you know, I had similar feelings when I saw the first covid map. By the way, so when you you know, it was like, holy crap, really? That's that's what the country is. I had a I, I thought it was something else. It's like finding out you have a, a serial killer in your family. You're like, wait a minute. This is not the family I signed up for. This is land of the free, home of the brave. I fought eight years in the military for this place. And you're telling me that half of them, you know, of all colors are holding up white genocide signs and, you know, all this stuff. And a big contingent of those people don't believe my life has intrinsic value on top of that. So how do you how do you live in that world? And then how do you live in that world as a photojournalist? So how do you separate or a photographer? 
how do you separate the emotion and the whatever feelings you're having, negative or positive, towards a certain situation, in this case, Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations, how do you separate that from getting the shot? Or do you use that? Do you use all that angst and negative energy to drive the shot and the story that you're trying to tell? How do you approach it? I lean into whatever emotion comes up. Um, I, When I think about photojournalism and the, and the idea that, like, people can be objective and can separate themselves from things emotionally. Um, I don't personally adhere to that because I don't, I think it would do a disservice to the work that I do. So I lean into whatever the emotion is that I'm experiencing and the emotions that I'm witnessing when I'm shooting and use it to inform the shot and the composition and the lighting, because my, my goal is to not just show the feeling, but make, the viewer feel what is happening, even if it's mm -hmm. through how I'm feeling it. I feel like that's the one of the most important pieces of how I decided to shoot documentary work. And how and how do photographers, if if, if other photographers are listening and watching to watching this interview, and they want to engage, you know, let's say another black photographer or a person of color, and they want to go out and document what they're feeling and what's going on in the city around them. Having done that, what are some tips that you can give them on how to get it, get the shot, but get out, <laughs> get out with the shot and not get COVID and not, you know, get into any altercations or anything like that? A huge part of it is planning. So I have a plan before I leave. I know where I'm going. People know where I am. Um, making sure you have the proper protective gear. If you don't, don't go. There are some activations, events, protests that I just simply have chosen not to go to. One, because I don't feel safe. It's not led by an organization that I trust. Um, or you just have a bad feeling. You don't, you don't need to put yourself in every single situation. Like I personally will not be getting arrested or shot at because I have to get this final shot. Like it's not worth it to me, especially because I'm freelance. Like I'm not having the backing usually of a newsroom or, you know, a company who's going to come get me out of jail or pick me up from the hospital, especially now because there's no, you can't even go to the hospital. So right. what I would suggest is like spending time, but like also not rushing to photograph everything. Like one thing that I really, really tried to do was like making my presence felt with the organizations and particularly the families that are associated with BLMLA so that uh, there's like a level of respect. They can feel that I'm there out of respect and like picking those moments, picking and choosing moments to shoot that resonate but aren't intrusive, which is difficult when families are up on stage talking about, you know, how their loved ones were murdered by the police and like, mm -hmm. There, there are just some shots that don't need to be taken or don't need to be posted and spending time engaging with your community and the people who are there. Like there was, after Dijon Kazi was murdered, I went that night um, to his neighborhood and I just took a second and looked around and I noticed that all of the people like gathered in the group, 99% of them were not from the neighborhood. Um, and a fair majority were not black. And then all the residents were lying in the street outside of their homes. And there was this clear tension, but it didn't feel as though the crowd recognized that and respected it as they were antagonizing the sheriffs and like shouting and doing things without the understanding that like, you're now putting these residents in harm. Like the sheriffs know where these people live. They will terrorize them. Like you have to follow the lead of the people who live there. So I put my camera away and I just went around and started talking um, to the people who live there. The neighbors of the man who's been killed, the family members, like just building that rapport and showing that that sense of community and just respect goes a really, really long way. Especially as more and more events happen, people start to recognize you and you will have access to better shots and more situations when you take the time to build those relationships.
Yeah, I think that's that's the key word. This is the relationships because one of one of the questions on my list to ask you was how do you how do you separate the you know the act of documenting a situation and getting the shots you know for whatever end result that those shots are going to go go to how do you separate that from the reality of and and how do you keep from being part of the situation. Right, because they, they teach us when you're learning how to be a photojournalist, you're a fly on the wall. You're not supposed to, don't contaminate the soup. You know, you're documenting it and can't edit the photos. Can't take, you know, it's it's got to be that purity. At being black and being in Los Angeles and going to these things, is it possible to to remain completely photographically objective from these situations that you're documenting, or on the other hand? Is, is that a superpower in these situations that you are black and you are telling these stories from a black perspective that couldn't necessarily be told or be, be credible from people that aren't black? Like, how, how do you feel about that? It is absolutely a superpower. It is that extra layer of authenticity that nobody else can bring to the table when it comes to shooting things in this movement. There's there's a nuance and an understanding that only Black people can bring to photographs in relation to Black Lives Matter. And I completely, completely believe that to be true. Like, there's no question about that. There's those, those small moments and things and feelings, those those head nods as we're walking past each other, just the small moments of care and compassion that other people will gloss over because they simply are not a part of this community. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. There's so much to talk about. You got to come on the podcast again because we, it's... <laughs> I'm skimming the surface on a big mind map of stuff that I need to ask you. You know, I want to I want to segue a little bit into the you know, I have in my notes here that you have been featured in Rolling Stone, Time, the New York Times, and these are I'm, I'm assuming these are some of the clients they were shooting like the Trump rally and these other places for. Take us take me into that that world of you know being a self taught photographer and then having a photo in the New York Times, which feels, or Rolling Stone, it just feels like the holy grail of, of shooting. How did that come about? Absolutely. Those were some of the greatest moments. Like I worked so hard to just produce work that meant something to me and then to have it recognized and be able to hold it like in magazines and see it in print was such a special moment, being able to share it with family and friends who supported me. Um, and so the kind of segue into those moments was the work that I did months prior, was the work that I did in relation to COVID documenting, which gave me the sort of foundation that I needed to prepare for the documentation of the Black Lives Matter movement, which as soon as that started to explode, those photos started to make the rounds. I started to end up on the Black photojournalist list, and then it just kind of went from there. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go. And now keep the momentum going, right? <laughs> keep shooting. We're still, like we said at the beginning of this interview, we're still, I don't know, we beginning, middle, who knows where we are with all this stuff, but the history is literally unfolding daily, right? Like today you saw the news today about the, the whole Senate runoff in Georgia, Right. So that's and then the challenging of the Electoral College. So there's all kinds of stuff happening. And we're only what, six days, six days into 2021. And it's already feels like we're six months in. So what's what's next for Alexis Hunley? What, what do you want to do? What What is if I interview you again um, this time, January 6th of 2022, what will you tell me about your most important accomplishments over the year? Oh, my most important accomplishments through 2021. I look forward to chatting with you in 2022. And I look forward to telling you about the amazing covers that I've shot, but also the the exhibitions I've been a part of and the awesome commercial work and campaigns that I've been able to shoot. I 
love so many different avenues and aspects of photography. And so I look forward to continuing to expand into these different spaces and advertising, commercial and fine art and in the editorial space. So love it. Love it. And then finally, this is a, you know, photography is a time machine. So is podcasting. So this is a message in a bottle. This is your chance to put a message in the bottle digitally for Alexis Hunley 2022. What would you tell her? about what's going on right now. Like what yeah, in retrospect, you're 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 watching this video in 2022. What do you want to tell yourself? Ooh, that's a good one. What would I want to tell myself? Hmm. Lean into your self-care. Take care of your body, take care of yourself, and everything else will fall into place. Love it. Love it. I'm trying to do that, too. That's what New Year's resolution is to, is to lean into the self-care from all angles, mental and physical. Right. It's not just not just lift your weights and walking or running. It's up, up there because that, that controls the whole thing. Alexis, um, if people want to look at some of your work, connect with you, hire you, all that good stuff. What's a, what's a good location for them to punch into their web browser? Absolutely. So you can check out more of my work on my website. It's alexishunley.com. You can find me on Instagram at by by Alexis Hunley. Um, and both of those places have my email address and you can just shoot me an email and we can chat. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been Thank a pleasure you. chatting with you. And like I said, I think I said this off camera, the, your, your name, Alexis is my favorite name. That's the name of my first daughter. So, <laughs> And, and I'm even prouder that she has that name now that I see you have it as well. So oh, I really appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, Alexis, thank you. And you have a good rest of your week. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. You too. Look forward to chatting with you again. This is Twitter.